A woman found a baby buried alive. 20 years later, she receives a call that changes everything. There are about 1.5 million adopted children in the United States. We've all heard stories of adopted children reunited with their birth families after years or decades apart. But in the case of foundlings, these reunions can be even more extraordinary. Check out this video to hear about a family who lived in the same town without knowing it and the even more astonishing story of a woman who found a baby buried alive and was reunited with him 20 years later. One Saturday evening in 1998, Azita Milani was out running with her dogs. She'd been invited to go dancing instead, but felt disciplined to go out and was enjoying her job through the foothills of Alto Dean, 50 miles outside of Los Angeles, California. A series of accidents and impulses meant that she was not following the trail she normally went down, but a path completely unfamiliar to her. Suddenly, a strange feeling came over her, perhaps a premonition. She felt as though she was going to be sick. Her dog, Tango, had also felt something. He'd run off into the trees a few yards away. Azita tried to get Tango to move on, but he refused to leave the spot. She'd thought he had found an animal or something in the bushes, but when she looked closer, she saw something poking up out of the ground, the tiny feet of an infant. Azita screamed and pulled her dog's back, then scrambled to dig the baby out of the ground with her hands. It was a newborn baby boy, wrapped in a blue towel, alive but barely, with the umbilical cord still attached. Although Azita tried several times to call 911 for help, she kept getting disconnected. In desperation, she finally flagged down a passing motorist who made the call. While she waited for the police to arrive, Azita dug the dirt out of the baby's nose and mouth with her fingernails, reassuring him that she would not leave him, that he would be okay, and pleading with the baby not to die. It took 911 about 30 minutes to arrive. In that time, Azita panicked that the baby had died, but he weakly grabbed hold of her wrist and she continued to talk to him, comforting him. When the Los Angeles deputies, Darren Harris and Joel Nebel, arrived on the scene, they checked the baby's vital signs and instantly realized the situation was critical. They requested paramedics to the scene immediately, and the paramedics took the baby away without delaying. When he reached the hospital, the baby's temperature had fallen to only 80 degrees, and he had to be treated for severe hypothermia. The doctors believed that the baby's weight had enabled him to survive. He was a healthy 7 pounds 12 ounces. Despite the expectations of the staff at Huntington Memorial Hospital, the baby made a miraculous recovery. Hospital nurses had named him Baby Christian, and people from all across the United States who heard a story were sending him toys, clothes, and money as donations. As soon as she was allowed to, Azita also paid the baby a visit. She brought him a bag of clothes she collected for him and watched him sleeping inside his incubator. Although she was tempted to adopt him herself, she'd been in the press as the one who had found the baby, and she worried that it would have make him easy to find and identify and potentially put the child's life at risk a second time. No one knew what had led the baby to being buried in the bushes. Authorities suspected that he was the child of a frantic young mother who panicked and didn't know what else to do. Police had searched the area but had been unable to find any clues as to who had left the baby to die there. They also put forth a $5,000 reward for anyone with information which could help identify the baby. No one came forward. However, police did receive a call some days later from a young person who asked what the penalty would be if the person who abandoned the child were to come forward. Shortly afterwards, perhaps the same young woman called the hospital to ask about the baby's progress. Azita Millennia was also called the hospital regularly. She felt a strong connection to the baby and hoped to be able to maintain contact with him, but was eventually told that the child had been adopted and that she would be unable to see him. It was devastating to her to have lost contact with the child, but Azita turned the loss to good use. She started a nonprofit organization called Children of One Plant, which helps orphan children around the world. She also began a company called Tosca Evening and Dancewear, which organizes fashion and dance events to raise money for children in need. Both organizations continue to this day. In the meantime, 20 years later, a young college student named Matthew Whitaker was in the car with his godmother. Three years before, he'd learned that he was adopted, but now his godmother asked him if he had any knowledge of the conditions under which his adoption took place. Matthew didn't, and was astonished to learn that he'd been buried and left for dead as an infant before being rescued by a jogger. This was a horrifying thing to find out. Matthew now knew that his chances of survival had been slim from the very start, and the fact that he was alive was a miracle. He did not realize, though, how much of a miracle it really was. Being buried would mean he had to be found within a crucial few minutes. 
Everything would have to line up perfectly, and it appeared that it did. All that was left was to put the two together. This happened in a roundabout way. The mother of one of Matthew's friends had rode into a local radio station thinking that Matthew's story might garner interest and that he might find out more about himself via a DNA test. One of the show's producers, Patty Rodriguez, remembered reading the story of a baby found buried just outside L.A., and when the DNA test confirmed that Matthew was the baby boy found by Azita Melania in 1998, she was determined to reunite the two on the air with a Ryan Seacrest program. The moment Azita had dreamed for for 20 years was here. In a moving reunion, Azita was introduced to the now-grown-up Matthew. She felt that she knew him, had imagined him looking almost exactly as he did in real life. Together, they were driven back to the place in the foothills where Azita had found him as a baby and where a grateful Matthew would have died if not for her. Matthew now attends the University of Arizona, where he's studying to become an entertainment lawyer. His adopted mother works in education and law, and his father was in the military and law enforcement before his death a few years ago. Both parents loved their son fiercely, supporting him in school, and invaluable, which he's played for most of his life. Azita continues to run her nonprofit to support orphan children, but now something's different. When he graduates, Matthew wants to help her with her work. The two remain in close contact and are grateful to be in each other's lives. Simon and his siblings Simon Jeffrey had spent his entire adult life hoping to find his birth family. Simon had been left outside a UK pub in a corned beef box with two tans of corned beef in 1963. Having tried everything to no avail, Simon approached the TV show Long Lost Family in an effort to track down his parents. The show was started for just this purpose, although Simon wasn't sure whether it was actually real. Like many reality shows, there was a good chance that it was all scripted and that Simon would not be able to find his family at all if he didn't find them before the show started. Nicknamed Oliver Twist by hospital staff, Simon was taken in by Graves and foster carers Kathleen and Ernest Jeffrey, who went on to adopt him. Although his adoptive parents passed away some years ago, he still lives in the same house with his wife Jane and son Jack, five miles from the pub where he was found as an infant. He hadn't ever moved away. He was hoping that if he stayed nearby, his birth mother would be able to find him if she wanted to. He did love his adoptive parents, and he was grateful for the help over the years. However, he still wanted to find the people that he shared blood with, even if he could not explain why. It plagued his every thought, and he always wondered whether they were thinking of him at all, or whether they wanted him back. Maybe they were looking for him too, or maybe they wanted nothing to do with him. Simon assumed that if he had siblings, he would be the oldest of them. However, he was surprised to learn that he was the youngest of seven. His siblings speculated that his mother was suffering from postpartum depression and unable to cope with having had seven children in less than ten years. The family figured that their father must have known about the baby and that he must have driven Simon to the pub and left him there that night. Figuring that the family couldn't cope with another mouth to feed and that the busy pub would ensure that someone found the child. None of Simon's siblings had any knowledge that there had been another child as they were growing up. Another surprise was that not only had Simon and his siblings grown up about two miles away from each other, but that he and one of his sisters had worked in the same co-op for a time in 1986. That was a coincidence that told Simon it was meant to be. He was meant to find his long-lost family. He soon found out a secret that changed his life forever. One of his brothers, Stephen, told him that toward the end of his life, the mother had told them that there was another son and pleaded with him to find the boy. But Stephen had assumed that her mind was wandering or that she was referring to one of the brothers who had passed away. However, this news was comforting for Simon. It proved to him that he'd not been forgotten, and indeed, he'd been spending birthdays and Christmases with his siblings ever since they came into each other's lives.